Hi, I'm Adam, and I created a website called The Hall of Stats. Uh, this is a presentation that I gave at the uh, January 2014 Boston Sabre Chapter meeting, and I wanted to record it to share with others. So the Hall of Stats is a alternate Hall of Fame populated by a mathematical formula. Now, obviously, there are many issues with Hall of Fame voting right now, and I'm going to get into some of those. But basically, what I noticed was the generation that was being hurt the most is my generation, the players that I grew up watching. So they're having a really hard time getting into the Hall of Fame, most of them anyway. So I started wondering a couple years ago, this is right around the time that Sean Smith and Baseball References uh, Wins Above Replacement came out, could a mathematical formula do a better job of populating a Hall of Fame than the voters do? Now, I think that uh, it actually does. I'm not going to say that it's perfect, but I feel that it's a good starting point and it does a really good job of visualizing the Hall of Fame standard. So the, the formula that I use is called Hall Rating, and it combines baseball references, wins above average, and wins above replacement, and runs uh, through a whole bunch of adjustments that I make that I'll talk about shortly. The premise is that there are 211 players that are in the Hall of Fame for their major league playing careers. And when you rank everybody by Hall rating, that ranges from the number one player of all time by Hall rating, Babe Ruth, all the way down to the 1,729th player of all time, which is Tommy McCarthy, yet he's in the Hall of Fame. What the Hall of Stats does is it ranks everybody by Hall rating, and the top 211 eligible players are the ones who are in the Hall of Stats. So what ends up happening is 69 players are removed. Now, I also maintain a personal Hall of Fame at the uh, Hall of Stats website, and I don't agree with all of these removals. There are 19 players that the Hall of Stats removes from the Hall of Fame that I would actually keep in, and that's for a variety of reasons. So likewise, 69 players are then added to the Hall of Fame, and also there are about 19 of these that I don't agree with. Like There are some players that the Hall of Stats says are hall rarity that I probably wouldn't put in. Now the 100th guy, who happens to be Billy Pierce, is given a Hall rating of 100. So for that reason, uh, anybody above 100 is in the Hall of Stats, and anyone below is out. So that's an easy way to see who belongs and who doesn't. So just to go into the formula a little bit more, Hall rating is an adjusted version of war plus a weighted adjusted version of wins above average. And then that's all indexed to 100. So let me talk about these components. The adjusted war component is what I use to measure the longevity of a player's career. So I start with baseball references, wins above replacement, and then I run through a, a few adjustments. The first one is for schedule length, and this is key for 19th century players because uh, players like Deacon White only played 29 or 60 or 80 game seasons and therefore couldn't accumulate quite as much war as a player today can in a 162 game season. So what this does is it prorates uh, the length of their seasons. Uh, I don't just give full credit for the prorating, I give, it, uh, I give them credit for the halfway point between what they actually earned and what their prorated total would be. So let's say that a player had an 80 game season and was worth two war. I wouldn't then give him four war, I would give him the halfway point, which is three war. Catchers have a very difficult time accumulating quite as much war as other positions because well, catching is hard. If I didn't give any kind of catching adjustment, there would only be like five or six catchers in the Hall of Stats, and that's just not right. So I give an adjustment based on playing time at the catcher position. So for that reason, a catcher like Thurman Munson is going to get a lot more credit for uh, catching than uh, Joe Torrey, for example, would. He caught about 40% of the time. Same thing with relievers. There are only two relievers that have a haul rating of 100 or better, and that's after I give them an adjustment based on the amount that they relief. And uh, so that means one of two things. Either I'm not doing relief pitchers right, or relief pitchers just don't accumulate Hall of Fame level value very often. So it's one of those. And then 19th century pitchers, kind of the opposite of uh, catchers and relievers, they, they have an easier time accumulating war because they always pitch so much. Uh, so I actually give a reverse adjustment for pitchers before 1893 when the mound was moved back. 
that kind of cuts down their war totals a little bit. So similarly for wins above average, I uh, use this as a measure of peak value for a player. So one thing that I do here is I ignore negative seasons in order to truly capture a player's peak. So a player that this affects uh, very heavily is uh, Pete Rose. So he hung on for many, many years, hovering between replacement level and average, trying to beat that hit record. So all of those seasons really cut down on his wins above average total. I just ignore those seasons for this component. You know, the fact that he hung on forever is captured pretty well in his longevity. Uh, statistic, so I just ignore that here and just double up on the actual peak value. I drop the wins above average from some situations such as uh, pitchers hitting stats or the union association, just situations where uh, they're getting extra credit even though the average performance was very near replacement level. I give the same adjustment for catchers and relievers and the same one for 19th century pitchers. And the 1.79 is so that I can weigh peak and longevity equally. Obviously, the wins above replacement numbers are bigger than the wins above average numbers because they include the replacement level. So the 1.79 is just meant to even that out. So there are some known limitations with this formula uh, that I'll certainly acknowledge. No Negro League stats. I don't have good enough numbers to use to include Negro League players. Uh, I have my eye on seam heads. I'm hoping to get a database at some point where I can do the same thing with the Negro League players, but for now I'm not able to. I don't make a military adjustment, so players like Ted Williams or Joe DiMaggio are going to have a little bit lower haul ratings than you would think. The players that this really hurts are guys like, like Bobby Doer and uh, Billy Herman, who actually drop a little bit below the 100 haul rating line, but if they had had their full careers, they would actually be over they were that close. I don't make an adjustment for postseason. I used to in an older version of the formula, but I haven't fallen in love with any formula for postseason um, win values, so hopefully at some point I will. So let's get into the backlog. There's a problem. There, are, there were 18 players on the 2014 Hall of Fame ballot that had a 100 or better Hall rating, and that's a lot. That's uh, you know, almost twice as many players as you're allowed to vote for. And that doesn't even include four players that didn't have a 100 Hall rating that received quite a few votes as well. Fred McGriff was very close, Don Mattingly and Jack Morris, and then Lee Smith down at 62. So that's a good 22 players that, uh, at least 22 players that had solid Hall of Fame credentials that needed to be fit on a 10-person ballot. So why do we have this backlog? There are several reasons. The first one is PEDs. And how does the Hall of Stats handle performance-enhancing drugs? Essentially, it handles them like they're an incomplete data set. We don't know who did them, who didn't. So the Hall of Stats just throws it out and deals with the calculations without it. Then there's the suspicion of PEDs. And this is the one that really bothers me. This is what we're seeing with Craig Biggio, uh, with Murray Chass essentially keeping him out of the Hall of Fame this year because he felt two votes shy. Uh, this is Jeff Bagwell, Mike Piazza. They were big guys. They hit a lot of home runs, but that does not mean necessarily that they used performance-enhancing drugs. There's no evidence. There's no failed tests. These players have denied it. I feel that it's not fair to hold them out because of that. There's really no way that they can prove their innocence because they can't go back in time and give you a test. And I just feel it's not very American even to withhold a vote from these players for that reason. And the last two that I'll get into in more detail are inconsistencies in player evaluation and the Hall of Fame standard over time. So let's talk about player evaluation. And to do this, we will talk about Burt Blylevin. So Blylevin was seen as a win for the uh, sabermetric community when he got into the Hall of Fame. But I just feel like he's a good example of the disagreement of player evaluation and the dif disagreement in standards over time. So Burt Blylevin had 287 wins. This is not a sabermetric figure. The only players outside of the Hall of Fame with more wins than Burt Blylevin are Roger Clemens, who's obviously out for different reasons, Bobby Matthews, who pitched in the 19th century, and Tommy John. 
Bly Levin struck out 3,701 batters. The only player with more than that not in the Hall of Fame is Clemens. He had 60 shutouts. Nobody had more than that without getting into the Hall of Fame. And this one's a little bit more sabermetric, but ERA plus is just ERA adjusted for era and park. So he had a 118 ERA plus in 4,970 innings. Nobody in history has had that combination without getting into the Hall of Fame. So Burt Blylevin had a 188 Hall rating, and that was eighth all time when he was inducted, among, among eligible players at least. And this is why the sabermetrics folks were going crazy about Bly Levin not being in. By all the standard stats, he, you know, all of the traditional stats, he stacks up by the advanced stats even more so. So one of the key reasons why Bly Levin did not get into the Hall of Fame is he had no Cy Young awards. And that's a problematic reason to keep somebody out of the Hall of Fame because, yes, he was underappreciated then, but to to withhold the Hall of Fame induction because he was previously underappreciated is just double jeopardy because he was uh, the first place war finisher on two occasions. He had two second place war finishes, two third place war finishes. You know, Bly Levin didn't get any Cy Young awards, but that doesn't mean he didn't actually deserve any. So let's go into the 1973 Cy Young Award and just explain how Burt Bly Levin compared to the actual winner, Jim Palmer. So Palmer finished first, and Bly Levin finished seventh, which is way down the ballot. Let's see why. Wins and losses. So Palmer was 22-9, and nine, which is a very shiny 7-10 winning percentage. Bly Levin did win 20 games, but he also lost 17, which is just a 5-41 winning percentage. Innings. Uh, Palmer had several. Uh, Bly Levin had more. Palmer led the league in ERA with 2.40. Uh, but Blylevin was right behind him, and because of uh, the adjustments made for Park, he actually had a very similar, in fact a little bit better, ERA+. plus. Strikeouts and walks. Palmer only struck out 158, and he walked 113, so he only had 1.4 strikeouts per walk. Uh, Blylevin, meanwhile, uh, led the league in strikeouts per walks. He fanned 258 and walked just 67. So their wins above replacement... Palmer had a very solid 6.3, but Bly Levin's was actually 9.9. .9. And uh, I would expect, by looking at the raw stats, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know I see a very similar ERA plus in more innings, I would assume that Bly Levin would have a higher war and would probably deserve to win. I wouldn't think that the, dis the, the difference would be that big, though. So where is this huge discrepancy coming from? And it's these guys. So these are four players that played behind Jim Palmer that year. Bobby Gritch was worth 21, uh, sorry, 29 win, uh, runs above average on defense. Mark Belanger, 26. The late Paul Blair, 19. And Brooks Robinson, who wasn't so bad himself, was fourth with 18 runs above average. So what wins above replacement does is when it sees that these are for incredible fielders, is it takes some of the, the runs allowed credit away from a pitcher like Jim Palmer and gives it to the fielders. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that just sounds like the right thing to do because these guys were actually providing value. If you don't do that and just go by ERA, you are essentially just ignoring the impact of the defense. And uh, these guys obviously were good fielders because in 1973, all four just happened to win the gold glove that year, too. So this is also a perfect example of how the advanced metrics perfectly match up with uh, the traditional awards. So I want to go into some research that Brian O'Connor uh, did. He's a friend of the site. So basically, he, on his list, published this list here of ballplayers. And what do they have in common? Well, they all have the shiny round number of 300 wins, 500 or more home runs, 3,000 or more hits. Palmero obviously had two of them. And then let's go ahead and cross out some guys. And why are we crossing these guys out? Obviously, it's because of ties with PEDs. And what are we left with? Maddox, Glavin, Thomas, and BGO. And that is essentially, well, it is exactly the ranking that players finished uh, on this last Hall of Fame ballot. 
And if you want, you can even cross out Biggio because Murray Chass insisted that he did steroids. And for that reason, he finished two, vo two votes shy. So Maddox, Glavin, and Thomas are all we're left with. And those happen to be the three guys that got into the Hall of Fame. So, you know, as cold as it may seem for me to use a mathematical formula to populate the Hall of Fame, that seems to be what the Hall of Fame voting uh, voters are doing lately as well. And their formula, unfortunately, is 300 wins or 500 home runs or 3,000 hits minus steroids equals the Hall of Fame. And that's just not the right way to do it, in my opinion. So now I want to talk about the backlog, uh, take four, uh, sorry, three pitchers and compare them. So those three pitchers are Kurt Schilling, Mike Mussina, and Tom Glavin. You notice that Glavin is the one that got into the Hall of Fame, but Schilling and Mussina actually have higher Hall ratings. So let's look into why a little bit. By wins and losses, Glavin obviously had the 300 wins, but he also lost 200 games giving him a 600 winning percentage, which is basically in line with Schilling, and it's way behind Messina. Messina had a 638 winning percentage, and he won 270 games. That's pretty close to 300. Innings pitched, Glavin did have more than anybody else on this list. In terms of ERA, Kurt Schilling really dominates this because not only does he have the best ERA and the best ERA+, plus, but ERA, of course, is based on earned runs allowed, and Kurt Schilling also had this weird knack for never giving up unearned runs. Mike Mussina actually has a better ERA plus than Glavin because he pitched in a more difficult American league, and once you adjust it, the ERA plus uh, makes him show up a little bit higher on the list. In terms of strikeouts and walks, uh, Glavin is very similar to Jim Palmer. Uh, 2,607 versus 1,500, so just a 1.74 ratio. Schilling had the most strikeouts and the best ratio of all time other than Tommy Bond. And Musina, of course, didn't walk anybody, so his ratio is quite good, too. And then there's the voting percentages. Um, this doesn't... It just doesn't make sense to me that Glavin would get 91.9, while Schilling actually dropped about 9 points down to 29 and Musina debuted on the ballot at 20%. And just to look at their Hall ratings again, 170 for Schilling, 161 for Musina, 147 for Glavin. And this 170 for Schilling does not include his postseason career, which he's essentially the best postseason pitcher of all time, so that's not even factored. So beyond Glavin versus Musina and Schilling, let's look at a couple other pitchers from the ballot too. And this one really drives me crazy when you look at the raw numbers, not even sabermetric numbers. Mike Mussina versus Jack Morris. Mussina had more wins, fewer losses, better winning percentage. Morris had a few more innings. But Mussina had the much better ERA and much better ERA+. plus. More walks, fewer strikeouts, much better percentage. Yet, Morris had 61.5% of the vote, and Mussina had 20. I can't look at this. This is no sabermetric numbers involved at all. I can't look at this and see how you could make a case for Morris over Mussina, but a lot of voters did. And, well, we do know why. Morris has become a cause. A vote for Jack Morris is a vote against stats. It's not even a vote for Jack Morris anymore. It's just, you know, it's these old-time voters saying that you know, Jack Morris was the type of pitcher who belongs in the Hall of Fame, and they're just forgetting the type of pitcher that Jack Morris actually was. If you look at the numbers, it just doesn't add up. And just to look at their Hall ratings, 161 for Messina versus just 75 for Morris. Let's compare Morris to a pitcher from his, his uh, same career. Uh, Dennis Martinez, go figure. Similar wins, similar losses, similar winning percentage, similar innings. Similar ERA, except that Martinez was a little bit better. Similar strikeouts and walks, yet 61.5% for Morris and just 3% for Dennis Martinez. Now, what do the Hall ratings look like for these guys? 93 for Martinez versus 75 for Morris. So once again, why is Morris's so low? And uh, we'll go back to the Jim Palmer thing. Except let's use a quote from... Uh, Lou Whitaker. Jack Morris was no better than Alan Trammell and Lou Whitaker. 
If we didn't make the plays and we didn't come up with the big hits, Jack Morris wouldn't be where he is or where he was or where he is. And that was just uh, January 3rd that Lou Whitaker said that. And Lou Whitaker's right. So if you look at the defensive numbers behind Jack Morris, from 1977 to 1990, the Detroit Tigers were worth 354 total zone runs above average. And you'll see who the top two guys are on that list, Alan Trammell and Lou Whitaker. Now also on the list are Chet Lemon and Darrell Evans, who are also in the Hall of Stats, while Jack Morris is not. And it's not just Morris. Tom Glavin is a little bit lower than you would think because he took advantage of the same thing. During his time with the Braves, they were 327 runs above average, and a good half of that was under Jones. And when you have an under Jones in center field, it's really going to help your ERA. And what war does is it takes that credit that the fielder actually deserves and gives it to him rather than the pitcher. All right, so let's do a very similar thing with three of the hitters. Now, obviously, Frank Thomas got into the Hall of Fame, and very much deservedly so, but he trails Jeff Bagwell and even Larry Walker in Hall rating. So let's look at the components of war and see how Frank Thomas could actually possibly drop below those two guys. So the first component is batting, and Thomas dominates this category. Bagwell, of course, is a great hitter, but Thomas dominates. Now, look at Larry Walker's total way down at 418. Now, Larry Walker actually had a very similar OPS to Frank Thomas, so why is his batting run total so low? And that's because this war component of batting runs definitely takes in the course field effects and slashes Walker and slashes his, him hard. Like, Larry Walker, if not park adjusted, would probably be in the 650 range. But they... Uh, these park factors are taken into sabermetrics, and they adjust Larry Walker down to 418. I think it's a very fair adjustment. Next, base running and the ability to avoid grounding into double plays. Larry, Wa um, sorry, Jeff Bagwell was a great base runner, 30-30 man, uh, and you know he was just great on the bases. And but he grounded into a lot of double plays, but still he comes out as a net 14 above average in this. Larry Walker was great on the bases, stole a lot of bases, uh, not, not a ton, but quite a few, and he stole them at a very high rate. He stole them at a 75% clip, and he also avoided double plays. He gets 50 runs above average here. Thomas, meanwhile, was slow, grounded into a lot of double plays. He's 50 runs below average. Fielding. Jeff Bagwell was a great defensive first baseman, won a gold glove, probably deserved more. Larry Walker won several gold gloves, and that's reflected in his 94 total zone runs. Frank Thomas was a DH, and when he wasn't a DH, he was a butcher at first base, and it shows in his total zone runs. He loses another 65. So, position. Uh, War also adjusts for position, uh, because obviously it's if to find an average player at shortstop, it's much more valuable than an average player at first base, for example. So Jeff Bagwell played first base, so he actually loses 121 runs because that's a very low-value position. Larry Walker played the outfield. He still loses 75 runs, not quite as much. And Frank Thomas loses 181 runs uh, because he was a first base but also a DH. So remember this when you're looking at Edgar Martinez's Hall rating, which is very much Hall-worthy. DHs get slammed in war as well. So the Coors Field effect is captured very well, the DH effect is captured very well, but Thomas, Walker, and Edgar all above the Hall of Fame line by a lot. So let's total these up, and that's how you get Jeff Bagwell in the lead, Larry Walker after him, and Frank Thomas further down, but still very much Hallworthy. Let's go into Larry Walker some more. This is a little bit of a rant. So, Larry Walker had the 418 batting runs, he had 40 base running runs, and 75 fielding runs. How many players in history have that combination? Now, remember, these 418 runs are already park adjusted. So how many have that combo? Barry Bonds, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron. And that's it. Alright, let's just say, yeah, yeah, Coors Field, 
I don't believe it adjusted him enough. Let's give him half the batting runs. So knock it down to 209. How many players in history have 209 batting runs, 40 base running runs, and 75 fielding runs? Barry Bonds, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron. All right, let's say I don't believe it. He, yeah, he was a good base runner and he won all those gold gloves, but I don't believe any of these numbers. Cut all of them in half. So 209 b batting runs, 20 base running runs, and 37 fielding runs. How many players have done that? And it's still only 12 other than Larry Walker. <sighs> These are his Coors Field numbers. Larry Walker had a 1,172 OPS in Coors Field. And yes, that's magnificent. That's ridiculous. But look how much higher that is than anybody else who ever played at Coors Field. Yes, it's high. But the fact that it's this higher than anyone else in history, that means something. That means Larry Walker was special. In fact, let's go ahead and look at his totals. This is his career totals here, the 965 OPS. He had the 1172 OPS in cores, but he only hit in cores 2,500 times. So let's take all of those cores field plate appearances and throw them out. Pretend they never happened, not at all. That still leaves Larry Walker with an 873 OPS. So answer me this. How many corner outfielders currently in the Hall of Fame had an OPS lower than 873? And that's 28 of them. And for that reason, so Larry Walker with Coors Field completely eliminated and this is OPS, so it's not even factoring in his base running and his fielding. Larry Walker ahead of all of these Hall of Famers. This is why Larry Walker is absolutely a Hall of Famer. So let's shift gears and talk about the Hall of Fame standard. This is going by some uh, research done by Dave Cameron at Fangraphs and then later expanded on by Joe Posnanski. There are 8,900 players, uh, major league players, born between 1910 and 1960. 112 made it into the Hall of Fame. That's just 1.26%. 2,656 players were born in the 1960s. And just five are in the Hall of Fame. And up until last month, that was only two. That's 0.2%. Now, to maintain the same Hall of Fame standard that we had from 1910 on, by percent, in the 1960s, we should have 33 Hall of Famers that were born in the 1960s. And that might seem high, but that's because expansion. More players perhaps means more Hall of Famers. Maybe you don't believe that. Maybe you still think, even though there was expansion, we should just take the top players, not by percentage. So even doing so, 112 divided by five decades, we should have 22 Hall of Famers. So we should have anywhere between 22 and 33, depending on whether or not you believe the Hall of Fame should expand as the league does. So there just so happens to be 100, uh, there happens to be 34 players born in the 1960s with a Hall rating of 100 better. And th the Hall of Stats always seems to work out like this, where, where as the league grows, the number of Hall of Famers grows, and it's pretty much right on the dot, 34 instead of 33. So only five are actually in the Hall of Fame yet. That's Maddox, Glavin, Larkin, Thomas, and Alomar. I see about three more sure things. Johnson, Griffey, and Rivera when they hit the ballot. And I see five guys that I think are on track to get in without too much issue. I think Bagwell and Piazza will make it. I think Smoltz and Tomey might struggle a little bit. I think PGO is going to get in next year. So that still gives us just 13 Hall of Famers. So who else is going to get there? Players from this list? Or, well, who, who doesn't have a 100 Hall rating that might get into the Hall of Fame? I don't really see anyone. Uh, I don't know, Trevor Hoffman, maybe, but he's got a 62. Don Mattingly, Omar Vizquel. I don't see any of these guys having much of a chance either. So where are all these Hall of Famers going to come from? How are we going to get to our 22? How are we going to get to our 33? So, you know, maybe we'll, we should just wait for the Veterans Committee, right? 
So why not the Veterans Committee? Well, I've got several problems with that as well. First is that the Veterans Committee has stopped electing living ball players. Now, the last living ball player to get in by the Ver Veterans Committee was Bill Mazeroski. Also, this is a quote from Jay Jaffe. There is a human cost to waiting. And he said this about Craig Biggio, because he said, you know, Craig Biggio is young, but what about Craig Biggio's family? You know, do they have another year to wait? You know, does he have, you know, a parent or grandparent that's not going to make it to see just, be, just because two votes because of Murray Chass? And this, this brings me back to Burt Blylevin. Right around the time he hit the ballot, his dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And every year that went by was more and more excruciating because he was not going to be able to enjoy that with his father. And the last reason is that they simply deserve BBWA induction. And I looked into this as well. I thought, I really started wondering, you know, it's all these players. Is that because some of them should be making it by the Veterans Committee? What does the BBWA guidelines look like in terms of Hall rating? So let's look at this BBWA standard. Of the 211 current Hall of Famers, 115 were elected by the BBWA or by special election or runoff. So the 115th player ranked by Hall rating of all time happens to be Craig Biggio. So according to Hall rating, everybody above Craig Biggio deserves to be inducted by the BBWAA, whereas anybody below him, but still above 100, still should be inducted, but by the Veterans Committee. So still, 14 players on the 2014 ballot matched or exceeded Craig Biggio's uh, Hall rating of 125 and 21 players born in the 1960s matched or exceeded that standard. So let's look into some of the players that the Hall of Stats does add. So 15 players, of the 69, 15 were on the ballot last year. So there were 18 on the ballot with 100 or better Hall rating, but three of them got in. So we're left with 15, but those 15 are among the 69 that are in the Hall of Stats. The Hall of Stats also doesn't care if you're banned from the game. So Rose and Joe Jackson are in, uh, as is Eddie Sycott. Two are actually in the Hall of Fame. Joe Torrey and Clark Griffith are in the Hall of Fame, but not under the player designation. But the Hall of Stats believes that they should have been in under the player designation. So for that reason, I have uh, included them in this. So let's look at the best of the remaining players that don't fit one of these criteria. The top player is Bill Dahlin with his 143 Hall rating. Uh, possibly pronounced Dalen, not sure. So uh, Dahlin was just a couple votes shy uh, last time the pre-integration ballot got together and uh, inducted uh, Deacon White and others. So I think that in 2016 he stands a very good chance of induction. He's probably the leading candidate. Lou Whitaker, 142 Hall rating, right there. Uh, Alan Trammell is basically tied with him in Hall rating. Uh, they always show up together on these lists. Very similarly value, yeah, valuable, uh, both definitely Hall of Fame worthy. Bobby Gritch, also uh, very underrated uh, for many of the same reasons as Whitaker. Uh, just a very good defender, very good power. Took, took his walks, very underappreciated. Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown's a really interesting one because he should be discussed in those sentences with Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and you know guys that would be in the Hall of Fame if not for appearing, in Kevin Brown's case, on the um, Mitchell Report. But that never even came up because nobody considered him that good. And that's a problem, because at the time that Burt Blylevin was inducted, Blylevin obviously was the best pitcher outside of the Hall of Fame by Hall rating. Kevin Brown was second, and he just fell off the ballot after one turn. Rick Russell. What's interesting about Russell is the defensive adjustment that I talked about for Jim Palmer and uh, Jack Morris. Basically, no pitcher was hurt by his defense more in history than Rick Russell. And that's because he had players like Dave Kingman behind him. Kenny Lofton. He was on a 2013 ballot and fell right off. But he was well above the Hall rating standard. Another 19th century player, Jack Glasscock. He's one of three incredibly deserving shortstops, uh, along with Dolan and Trammell. 
Louis Tiant, 128. David Cohn, 127. He also fell off after one turn. Greg Nettles is actually tied with Craig Biggio with a 125 Hall rating. So all of these players that I just showed, they're all above that BBWAA standard. So this is the site. Uh, at the site, you'll find player pages for every player in history, uh, rankings for all franchises, all positions. You'll find similarity scores that are based not on their raw stats, but on these adjusted war components. You'll find articles, new research that I've done. The site is optimized for mobile, and it's open source, so if you want, you can download the code, you can download the data, play with it as much as you want. So I built this along with Jeffrey Chupp and Michael Berkowitz, and uh, check it out at hallofstats.com. Thank you.